Uh, so yeah, I'm Jeff Dagley. Uh, I work at uh, Zynga. Formerly, we were New Toy. So how many of you have played a with friends game? I like that. You keep me in a job. Uh, so yeah, we've got the with friends family. Uh, the back end is a rail service. On the front end, we've got, uh, let's see, how many play chess? Chess friends, chess with friends players? Yeah, there's a few of you. Words with friends, our most popular, yeah. Uh, scramble with friends, a few scramble players. Uh, on that, that's actually the older icon of hanging with friends. Anybody still play hanging with friends? Yeah. Uh, matching with friends, any matching players out there? Yeah, a few of you. And uh, gyms with friends. Uh, yes. That's the one I work on currently, so gyms with friends. Uh, actually, we've done a little bit of everything. Uh, all these games came out of uh, McKinney. So if you're wondering where uh, Words with Friends, Chess with Friends started, it was in the downtown public library of uh, McKinney. So the two brothers, Paul and David Bettner, uh, left their job when the iPhone uh, came out. They said, we're going to make, we're going to do something on this. Uh, it seems great. So they went up to, uh, they. They lived in McKinney. They went to the public library, sat in there because it was quiet. They could get out of the house and started building Chess with Friends. So for those of you who don't know, Chess with Friends was actually first. Uh, then they, they released it. It was kind of chugging along and uh, moving up. And then they built Words with Friends. So Words with Friends came along second. Uh, I joined, uh, started doing some contract work for New Toy in October of 2009, joined them full time. Uh, today is my three-year anniversary with New Toy slash Zynga. Um, so I'm excited. That's fun stuff. Three years. I mean, who stays at a company for three years these days, really? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's crazy. What's that? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? So these are, uh, we're going to talk about some of the mistakes I made. So I, I've been sitting in here listening to a lot of these talks about solving big problems, what you need to do to get this, and I'm going to talk about how we got to those problems. We didn't start off trying to solve those problems. Uh, we started off uh, two guys in a, uh, in a library building a, a game on an iOS that they didn't know. They didn't know the server back end. They were just building it as they went along. So we're going to talk about the mistakes we made, how we've corrected as those times have come along, uh, and where we're going forward. So um, on the, uh, I guess to you, it's the right-hand side of this screen, is the day the iPhone 4 launched, we, had, uh, we were the number one app in the uh, iTunes App Store. So that's an exciting place to be to kind of show where, we, uh, where, where we're coming from. So what do we have? Uh, here's the With Friends games. We've got Chess With Friends. This is just to kind of show you the, the ecosystem of what we're currently supporting. Uh, we have one back-end system that supports all of these different uh, games, and then each game has various clients that we're supporting, and then each client has various versions that they're supporting out in the wild. So uh, Chess has two, a free and a paid. Uh, Hanging has a ha free and a paid on iPhone. It also has an Android version. Same with Scramble. Matching and Gems both have iPhone free and paid versions. Words, obviously, our, our big one has iPhone versions, iPad versions, Android versions on Google Play and on the Kindle. Uh, we've got Windows versions now and uh, Facebook. So talk about supporting multiple clients, multiple platforms. Uh, this is what we're doing. Each of those version, each of those clients may have multiple versions out there. So we may release a, a version, but that doesn't mean that everybody immediately goes and updates right away. We still have uh, people that are playing on older versions of the uh, of the games out there. So. Uh, it's a fun, in quotes, a fun problem to try and solve to, to make sure that you don't break uh, older versions. Uh, in case you haven't heard, a few people like our games. You might have, uh, uh, have heard of Alec Baldwin, who apparently got kicked off of a plane because he was playing Words with Friends. Uh, these are some of the various people that have, uh, have tweeted or mentioned us uh, in their uh, various media outlets. Um, when they do stuff like this, it's, it's interesting because uh, we had in one case, uh, Fred Durst, the lead singer of Limp Bizkit, uh, he tweeted his username that hey, said, hey, in their game you can tweet, hey, play games with me. So he did that, and apparently a lot of people wanted to play games with him. And uh, we, had, we had done certain things like making sure there's a game limit. You can only start, uh, I think, 20, maybe 30 games now. Uh, how many games you, were, you can start. At the time, we didn't have a limit on how many games could be started with you. 
So all of a sudden, one evening, the server starts to go down. We're trying to figure out what happened. We finally track it down to the fact that everybody's trying to start games with him. So every time he starts up his phone, we're trying to pull that down onto his phone, and the servers are uh, not liking us very much. Um, so we decided to put game limits on the other side as well. So now if you try to start a game with somebody who's over their 20 game limit, it may tell you, hey, this person has too many games going on right now. So uh, it's, it's one of the, uh, the fun problems that we've had along the way. We all know that Rails can't scale. Uh, this is my friend Jason Seifer who's worked on us. He does the Ruby show, uh, has uh, nicely put up a couple of websites for us to check to see if Rails can scale yet. Uh, you can check those out. I'm pretty sure that the answer is still no, um, despite the fact that we're supporting uh, many, many users. But yeah, this is, uh, we all know that Rails can't scale, so that's a fun little joke. Uh, when I joined uh, Paul and David, we, we went to lunch one day. We were, we were talking about it. They were telling me about this, these games that they had built on the iPhone. And they said they had built this, this back-end web service uh, for the games. And they said it was in Rails. Um, and I said, why Rails? And, and Paul told me, he said, well, because Rails was sexy. Um, which seems like a very good technical decision. So I, you haven't heard that one thrown out yet as, a, as you know, helping you make your decisions uh, for what technologies to use. But if your technology is sexy, it, it just might work. Um, so uh, to which I asked him, because he was talking me, to me to help do some work on their Rails backend, was that because I was sexy as well? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what are we dealing with? We've got lots of constraints. Uh, one of them is backwards compatibility. I mentioned that earlier that we have, uh, obviously, the current iOS version is 6.12. Uh, the current Android version is 4.22. Uh, the number of Android versions out there is, uh, is huge, the number of devices out there. Uh, we do have the ability to force upgrade a client. So if, a client, if we put out a server change that we know is going to be break, uh, backwards incompatible, we do have the ability that when a client starts up, it will check with the server and say, I'm this version. And the, client, the server can send back and say, no, pop up an alert, tell them to go to the app store and download that. Because it's such a disruptive process to the end user, uh, we don't, we don't want to do that on a regular basis. So every time we push out a server change, we don't make everybody force upgrade. Uh, which means that there are parts of our code that are still in there that are checking to see if you're this version, then do this, or uh, parts, of the, uh, parts of the code that are, are in there, and uh, for example, one of them is to check to see if for some reason you're getting a negative ID coming up from the client from the scenarios where they were trying to convert a long, long uh, into an integer. And in those cases, you ended up getting a negative ID passed up, and so we have to explicitly say, oh wait, we recognize this scenario and uh, we know what to do with it on the server side. So we're a lot, uh, more, a or a lot more capable of reacting to uh, problems on the server side and can push out fixes to those. Um, but yeah. The, I, uh, oh, this is another fun one. The, when the clients were built, uh, it was basically built around uh, the Active Record 2 XML. So this was very, very early on. Um, we weren't using any of the JSON stuff. Basically, what we had done, uh, well, what had been done was uh, Rails generate scaffold, uh, and by default, you got two XML in there. And then on the phone, we just started requesting XML content. So that was what the early days of, and actually still most of the clients are requesting XML, XML uh, data from the service. Uh, we are moving new content over our new endpoints, new functionality over to JSON responses. Uh, but we still have a lot of stuff that is um, in XML, XML responses between the client and servers. And then the uh, game type, we do have multiple game types that we're supporting. So like I said, we have one service, the Games with Friends service, uh, that supports all six games today. There are more games coming. And basically a request comes in and it says, I'm this game. And from there we figure out how, to, how does this get, how does the logic get handled in there. So we've, we have early on, there were a lot of conditionals that say if this game type, then do this. If this game type, do this. We have since split out the game specific logic into smaller, uh, uh, smaller classes that can be uh, where all the, the game logic can be consolidated. But at the same time, 
for all the shared stuff. So things like uh, coins, when I'm, when I'm purchasing things, if I'm purchasing energy or if I'm purchasing coins, and that's something that all games are doing, uh, purchasing products. If I roll out a change to one of those, I've got to make sure that it doesn't break the other five clients. Uh, we have run into scenarios where you'll push something out and it seems like it worked great on words and scramble and all of a sudden you find out it didn't work nicely on gyms and matching. Uh, so those are uh, uh, fun things to, uh, to, to have to deal with. But we do have uh, test suites that we've put in place to, to catch a lot of those. They don't catch them all, but uh, we can catch uh, quite a few of them. So what did we do? Uh, we did not have a, uh, a big Ruby conference to come to. We did not sit around and think about how do we support uh, you know, 10 to 15 million people playing your game a day. Uh, we were trying to, the brothers were trying to figure out how to get people to play chess with friends. And that was what they were trying to solve. So all of our, uh, all of the growth that we've had, all of the problems that we've had have, have come along organically. Uh, our code base shows that. There's a lot of patches here and there to, to plug systems and to, uh, to keep it going. But at the same time, that's kind of, it's kind of what fun about it is to, to grow it and to have seen it kind of grow up and, and, uh, and deal with it. So how many Yagni? Anybody want to yell it out? What is it? You aren't going to need it. Gonna need it. Uh, we sat around early on uh, as we were starting to grow, and, and we'll talk some about this, was um, as our database was growing, we sat around and talked about, are, should we shard? Should we shard the databases? It's just getting, one of our constraints was uh, the database. And so could, should sharding uh, be the solution? And, and we decided that we, weren't, we didn't need to do that. There were other solutions that we could come to uh, before we needed to shard. So we were trying to do the simplest possible thing. And all the way along, that was one of our mantras, was do the simplest possible thing uh, that related to servers as we were growing up. Uh, which servers we were choosing, what was our schema going to look like, uh, what does our overall architecture look like. Did we need to split out the user service so it could be shared with all the independent games and we could run each game independently of each other. Which sounds like a great idea until you realize that you're basically uh, less than 10 people in a room trying to support uh, three or four or five different games with all of their servers and all of their databases and all of the, the stuff that goes along with that. So we would do the simplest possible solution uh, as we went along. So how did we, how did we scale our, our, our uh, infrastructure? Well, we started off on Slicehost. Uh, I think today the equivalent would be we'd started off on Heroku. Uh, at the time, it was just easy to get up on Slicehost. Uh, so we started off there. Uh, we eventually moved over to, to Rails Machine. They did a, a great job of actually getting us hardware uh, that we could use. It was a little bit more dedicated. It was still virtualized. Uh, but we, we grew, uh, we use Rails Machine to also help us do some of our uh, scaling as a code as well. They, they came in and helped us uh, optimize a lot of our, uh, our Rails code. We eventually moved over to SoftLayer. SoftLayer actually gave us dedicated bare metal machines. So we, uh, we were able to do that and they were able to spin up machines really quickly uh, for us as we continued to grow. And then lastly, we were acquired by Zynga and we've now moved into the Zynga Data Center. And if you want to feel what, it, uh, what it's like to have jetpacks on, uh, that's, uh, go to their data centers. And they are just, it's, uh, it's a great experience. It's an interesting experience. They uh, continue to, uh, to grow. So just some, uh, a little bit of stats behind it, talk about what we're dealing with. Uh, we've got 400 plus app servers that we're deploying on. Each of those app servers is running about 35 unicorns. Uh, we're dealing with, we've got 40 worker machines or 40 or more worker machines that we're dealing with that are just processing background queues. Uh, we're doing, we have about 70 memcache servers uh, or 70 plus memcache servers. We finally did shard. We've got 125 plus uh, MySQL shards that we're sharded our, sharded our database across uh, and each of those has a slave that's uh, for the backup. So times two. Uh, which is fun when we get ready to run migrations. Uh, we have three uh, fairly beefy uh, databases that store some of our uh, data that didn't make sense to get sharded. Uh, so we still have three, uh, three fairly large databases with that. Uh, we have two Redis databases that are also being backed up that we're using for uh, things like ResQ and for our ID uh, uh, generation. So we're doing that. 
Uh, we are using Capistrano for deployment, so we do have, we're still doing a lot of the traditional uh, Rails deployments, even on, a, on something that size. So, what were some of our pains? Uh, early on, it was MySQL related. Uh, when I sat, uh, I was in the office, uh, in, started in October of 2009. Um, there was one day we were watching, all of a sudden, looking at the iTunes data, there had been an uptick in the number of people playing uh, or downloading the game, and we were tracking that down, trying to figure out what had caused that little bend in the graph of people starting to play, and finally tracked it down to John Mayer had tweeted that Words with Friends was the new Twitter. And apparently, people wanted to go download the game and find out what that was all about. So we start getting more people. How many of you played three years ago? There's a few of you. How many of you remember how painful it was to play at night? How many of you were dedicated enough to wait 60 seconds for your move to go through and then come back so you could, or, and hopefully it went through, uh, for your move? It would take, a trans for us to make a move and push it up to the server, and for the server to process it and get back to you, it, at times in, in the evenings would take 60 seconds. Uh, it was fun to watch the new relic charts every night. There was, a, uh, there was definitely a cycle that would come across and it would go up and then it would flatline because we had peaked and we could not do anything more and then it would fall off and it happened every night and the, uh, the iTunes store would just light up this game, fix your servers, do stuff. You know, people were very upset that their 99 cent or free game was not working they will let you know because it is ruining their life. <laughs> yeah, so uh, some of the things we dealt with early on was things like MyISAM versus NODB. We got to something called the Movepocalypse, uh, right bound, we were right bound to the database. We talked about partitioning, we talked about sharding, so what is this? So early on, uh, like I said, we were on SliceHost. Paul and David said, okay, we're gonna spin up some servers, we'll just install My, uh, MySQL, we'll install, we'll get the basic stack up and going and we'll work uh, and get it going. Uh, what they didn't realize at the time was MySQL installs with MyISAM as the default engine, um, which when you get ready to insert data into uh, a table, it goes ahead and locks the entire table uh, versus NODB, which will do row locking, but the problem, obviously, you see where this is going with locking an entire table, is that when you're trying to insert a move one at a time and testing it, you don't see it. When uh, half a million people are trying to all play the game at the same time, this could be a problem. So, uh, unfortunately for us, we, I mean, we couldn't find this. It took uh, working with some uh, some outside contractors to come in and realize, oh, you have it, they have this set up. So it's e even little things like this, you're like, that seems pretty obvious now, everybody uses NODB, but these, these little things can come in and bite you. Move Movepocalypse, this was a fun one. Um, Rails, by default, starts off with integer IDs, which is great, as long as you're not inserting one row per move that's ever being made and keeping those around. Uh, so we ran into the problem or we foresaw, we, we got, started getting close to the problem where uh, we were about to run, over, run out of IDs. And actually, we wouldn't run out of IDs. I guess it would just keep going. I'm not sure what the default behavior was, but it was not going to be pretty. And uh, this was an interesting scenario because we not only had to fix the database on the server side, but all of the clients also, and at the time it was words and chess, but words and chess had to be updated as well. So there was a coordinated effort where we had to make the chi change on the client side, push those out to the app store, get them reviewed in time to get them pushed out so that they could support the ability for our servers to now c convert over to supporting long longs on the database. So this was what we, uh, we went ahead and, uh, and got that rolled over. You can see that date, uh, June 21st, 2010. Uh, was when we foresaw this is when it's going to happen, uh, which is a good thing to know. It's also very scary to see it coming and be the weekend that we were getting ready to make the cut over. Um, how do you get, you, so this was the other problem is with a table that large, MySQL, you cannot just change the data type on that column. So we had to get all of the data into a new table uh, that had been set up with the correct, uh, the cr correct data type. Uh, and we were doing that, and it uh, 
halfway through, or if, I don't even know if it got halfway through the, the copy, it actually, uh, the copy failed, and so we're stuck with, okay, what's the next solution? I'll tell you the next solution here in a couple slides. Uh, another scenario that we ran into, there was also uh, on moves, we had our, our move apocalypse. On the other side of things was the chat apocalypse. Uh, we thought, oh, we're, we're making a lot more moves. We'll never have to fix chats. Uh, we did end up having to fix chats, especially when we sharded. Uh, what happened, again, was the fact that when we sharded our database, we had to have an ID generator. And what we put in place was an ID generator, and we said, let's make sure that the first ID that it generates is far enough away from the last ID generator that was auto-incrementing in the MySQL table, in the, uh, the main MySQL table. So it was supposed to be bumped by uh, 10, uh, 10 million or 100 million. Uh, I think somebody added an extra zero or two in there. And so all of a sudden, we were bumping over the integer, uh, integer value on the server side. The clients were not updated to handle the, server si uh, the, the larger value. And again, we ran into that problem of very angry people with their 99 cent app now no longer able to chat in their apps. So uh, they will let you know. This is what it looked like uh, each evening. So we've got, uh, yeah, December 20th, 21st, 22nd. 20th. This is probably uh, 2009, maybe 2000. This was probably 2010. We were still, still dealing with some of that. No, it would have been 2009 to deal with looking like this. Um, we found that we were right bound. So we had gone through and we're trying to find, you know, what is the problem? Why can't we, why can't we just do more? And so when we began analyzing what uh, had happened, uh, we were using some cache columns. So Rails makes it very easy to go ahead and cache these values and we'll store it in a, in a database column for you. Uh, so we were storing on the game, what was the last move uh, user ID? We wanted to know who made the last move. Uh, on the user, what was your last move that you made? And the reason for this was so that when the client would, the client sits and polls the server to say, hey, is there anything new since the last time I checked? And here's the last thing that I know about. So it was just real easy if we just say, hey, let's just store the last thing that you know about. So when you poll us, we, we'll just look it up uh, and say, okay, this, he sent me this, and we look on the table, nope, there's something bigger than that, we'll send it back. Well, the problem was that every move you made meant that you had four database writes, uh, which, again, works at the smaller scale, doesn't work at the big scale. Uh, so we started looking for ways to, oh, man. We started looking at ways to, uh, to improve this uh, and moving a bunch of it to catch. That should have been cache. And the, the frustrating thing is, when I proofread it earlier, I said, I'm going to fix that, and I did not. So. Um, we also have run into things like um, 512 simultaneous connections uh, on a MySQL database. Uh, so being able to, to have those connections writing to, uh, to MySQL, to our MySQL databases, uh, which sounds, who's going to hit 512? Well, when you have 200 servers running 35 unicorns and then you've got uh, workers also all trying to connect to those databases, it's not hard for you to run over that, uh, that limit. So we put into place some connection pooling that we could make use of. Um, so that was a fun one. Uh, I, I should have at least put uh, some charts on there that would have shown how much some of the improvements. It is, it is fun to see these, though, because it was just painful time. Uh, so how did we deal with the, uh, the move apocalypse? Uh, and how did we deal with the, the growing size of our databases? Uh, so we kept all of the moves around. Um, so every move that's been made uh, from the beginning of uh, Chess with Friends is still around somewhere. All of your games are still around somewhere. Uh, and we started off, you'll, some of you may recognize this from your Rails world, we start off with the moves table, because that's the default. Rails, you just, you, if you have a move model, you've got a moves table. When we had the move apocalypse, we tried to, uh, the original solution was let's just create a new table, we'll copy everything over there, and it'll just work. Well, like I said, halfway through the copy, it didn't work. So the next solution was, this is how we came to this one, was partitioning. Let's just create a new table. It will be called the big int table, and we'll put in some logic that says, if you're an ID greater than X, then you're going to go to the big int table, and you're going to find your move data there. If you're less than this, then you'll end up in the moves table, which was great. Uh, but we quickly found out that we started filling those tables up, and they just got slower and slower and slower. 
So we already had this mechanism in place to partition the tables. Uh, and so we said, well, let's just make one more table. Let me, let me just tell you, these tables did not all originally exist. We started with moves. We got to big int moves. Um, the third table, one of the developers thought, let's just come up with a fun name. Big int moves wasn't very entertaining. How about the make you want to moves table? That seems like a great idea. Until you get ready to query the database, and every time you want to select something from the make you want to moves table. <laughs> Hence, the fourth one was the moves table. Much easier to, uh, to query from the database if you only have to type the underscore. Uh, so we got that. Continuing on, uh, we've got smooth moves. We've got night moves. And then the final iteration of that, and this is the move table that is now sharded across uh, the 125 plus MySQL tables is dance moves. So now if you are a, uh, one of the uh, database or the DBAs, you get to look in the table structure and you find a dance moves table uh, out there. And you probably have to scratch your head and go, what was going on? Um, the other interesting thing about this is we couldn't, at some point we couldn't keep these all on the same machine. Uh, they were just getting too big and too big. Uh, early on, our solution was just throw more hardware at it. So actually, not more hardware, throw bigger hardware at it. So as we were at Rails Machine, as we were growing, and they were saying, your, da your database is just isn't, it's not big enough. It can't keep all the, everything in memory. It, you can't, you don't have enough disk space. We said, well, can you solve that prop for us? And they said, yes, we can. We'll just get a bigger machine. And then we'd go through that, uh, that dance again, and they'd say, it's just, it's, you're having problems. Can you solve it? You need a bigger machine. And so we went and continued to do that uh, until we uh, had pretty much maxed out the size of the database that we could get. Uh, and that by that time, we were getting ready to, we were moving into the D Zynga data center. So sharding became a lot more uh, a possibility at that point. The other interesting thing with uh, tables, the moves tables, chats tables, users tables, all these tables that are this size, one of the problems you run into is that you just can't add a new column. Uh, at least not in, not in the MySQL world where you can just say, hey, go alter this table, add a new column so that I can uh, start tracking this data. Uh, one of the solutions we found, up, uh, found was uh, eventually we had on, at least on the, the moves table and on the games table, we had this generic text column that we said, hey, it's generic. We can use, for, use it for whatever we want. Let's just store JSON in it. So we just start sticking JSON in it. And so now we have a document store inside of our uh, MySQL database. So we can stick stuff in there, too, and they get around the uh, problem of having to, uh, having to uh, add new columns. So sharding. How many uh, have sharded databases? Yeah, a few of you. It's not fun. It's a little bit scary. I mean, just the whole terminology, my favorite quote was from uh, John Nunemaker, who was saying he hated the word shard. Uh, he said it sounded uh, so dangerous and, part and pointy. Uh, and it's just the way John is. Uh, but yeah, like I said, we sat around early on and talked about, well, do we, partition, do we shard now? Uh, can we come up with something that we can, that we can uh, some solution where, where sharding was the answer? And we actually pushed it off for as long as possible. Eventually, once we were in the Zynga data center, uh, we couldn't continue adding more machines, just the cost of that. Uh, at some point, we were five to 10 of these large, beefy database machines, and we just could not sustain uh, the cost of, uh, of buying those machines and, and running those machines. So we did have to uh, deal with sharding. Fortunately for us, by that point, uh, Zynga has a lot of experience sharding databases, so they were able to come in and help us uh, get the hardware up and running, come up with strategies of how we're going to shard. Uh, we did end up with about 125 plus uh, sh uh, primary or shards that we were dealing with that all have a, a backup so that we can fail over uh, to those. Let's see, how did we get there? Um, well, we had these large databases, had these large tables, and now all of a sudden we have these 125 plus databases with smaller tables, and we needed to make sure that the, the sharding that we had set up w was working. And I think somebody mentioned it yesterday that as we sharded the databases, we would start double writing. Uh, somebody was talking about it with their services. Uh, but we would actually double write to both tables, the main table that we were using and to the, the newly sharded tables, to make sure that everything was working. 
Uh, when we were confident that the data was being written correctly to both sets of the data, we would then switch it over from where the reads were happening. The reads would then happen off of the sharded tables, and, but we were still double writing to the older tables. Um, and then at some point we'd say, okay, we're confident this is working. We can shut down the older, writing to the older tables and we will run primarily off of the, uh, the, sh the sharded tables. We also went through the effort of backfilling uh, all of the data. So we were taking all of the data out of the older tables that were on these, uh, those other six or five different tables that were out there. We took all that data and put it on the shards so that we had all the data there and that way we could decommission those large machines that were really only sitting around to serve up moves tables, moves data. We also used, uh, at one of the problems you run into with sharding is now uh, what you had been using for auto incrementing IDs no longer works uh, because 125 different MySQLs all saying my next ID is two uh, isn't quite gonna work. So we moved to Redis for its unique ID generation uh, using it to, uh, uh, to generate IDs for all of our different sharded tables. Early on we didn't have any caching uh, it was basically a single rail server. Uh, we, eventually we would, we would add more rail servers. That was how we scaled. Uh, but we didn't have any caching. When we were dealing with Rails machine, they were very good about coming in and helping us set up some caching. We set up memcache. Uh, we would look for the problem areas. We used New Relic uh, to find problem areas and then go and attack that problem and say, okay, what in here can I cache? Those things like the, the last move user ID. We'd cache that, excuse me. We'd find other, uh, other areas and, then, and cache those. Nowadays, we cache a lot more. We've got, like I said, 70 plus memcache servers, so we keep as much in memory as we can. Um, and so we're, we're trying to catch that, has definitely improved it, uh, it to reduce the number of times that we're actually having to, to hit the database. Uh, we use cache money plugin. We've migrated it to Rails 3.2. We've done a lot of uh, tweaks on our side. Uh, to actually get it uh, working with a lot of the things that we're doing internally. Uh, so I don't think that the changes, all the changes we've made have been contributed back, but we were using cash money initially, and we have some now hybrid of that going forward. Things to, uh, to be careful with with caching, uh, expiration times. So how long is something going to live in the cache? Are you going to, if it goes away, what do your cache misses look like? Uh, those type of things. Growing the cache pool is interesting because when you add more servers, now your algorithm of trying to figure out where something should be in the cache changes. So adding more servers doesn't mean you immediately see a performance boost. Now you've got empty caches that have to fill themselves. Um, watching out for cached versions. So this version out there may be cached version number one, but you've since made some changes to that and you incremented its cache version, or you were supposed to increment the cache version, and now it's cache version two. Uh, but if you forget that, and we've run into this problem a, a few times where you forget to increment the cache version, and all of a sudden the version it's getting out of cache is the wrong version and it, can't, and it ends up breaking. The last one is, uh, was a fun story, was don't actually accidentally flush the entire cache uh, for your system. Your databases will probably not like you when everybody all of a sudden says, oh, I've got to go load this from the database. Uh, one day I was sitting around and we were uh, watching the service and all of a sudden you get these alerts that go off and you look on New Relic and everything's red because the service has gone down and we're all scrambling to figure out what happened and we finally realized that for some reason the, uh, all the cache hits, we were just, everything's a cache miss. We finally figured out that what somebody had done was we had, we had set up uh, our, our environment, and we had these configuration files and made it very easy to set up development environments based off of the uh, the configuration files, and a lot of times what you would do is just copy an existing environment's configuration file for your new development environment. And somebody had done that, had copied their development, had copied their configuration file, and the configuration file for memcache they'd used was the production memcache uh, configuration. And they were trying to do some stuff and decided to do a fl uh, dollar sign flush, or cache flush, and had flushed the, uh, the entire production server uh, cache. Um, so that's a fun one, uh, but, you recover, you, you, can, you can get over it, it, it does work. Um, let's see, caching, we're also using Redis. Uh, so we use the Redis gem, we're using the Redis server, 
Uh, I love Redis. It's, we, it's great. We've been able to move a lot of our background processing to, uh, to Redis for, and ResQ for things like Apple push notifications. So basically, we, every time you make a move, um, we send out a push notification to let your opponent move. It's now your, uh, know that it's now your turn. Um, so we queue those up. Facebook queries when we want to find out, you know, and let you know that your Facebook friends are now playing uh, words with friends or gems with friends. We queue that up so that we can go query Facebook and find out who all is playing. But we only do it as needed. So again, this is another one of those strategies of where, am I, where are my bottlenecks? What are the problems that I'm running into? Can I move that off? And this Redis and ResQ have been a great tool for uh, setting that up. Like I mentioned, we've got uh, two Redis servers. We use them for ID generation for the MySQL tables. Uh, we're also using them for the 40 plus workers that we have processing these, rest, these uh, background queues. Um, at scale, let's see, so problems tend to reveal themselves at scale. Uh, it's fun because the works on my machine uh, only gets you so far. Uh, but when you push it out to production and all of a sudden uh, 10 million people start hitting that, that, uh, that feature and it crashes, uh, it, you'll be very sad when, to see that, red, that new relic chart or whatever the chart is uh, go red. Um, so we, we tend to roll things out. Uh, not only performance improvements or just any feature, uh, we use something called rollout uh, that we can check to see, is this feature live? So is, when we are rolling out the sharding, we would say, is the sharding live? If the sharding's live, then let's go ahead and start writing to the table. Uh, and we can ramp it up with like 1% to make sure it's okay. 2%, 5%, what does it look like? And just keep watching the charts as we ramp it up. And this allows us to roll back and turn off features if we see that they're not working correctly. So that's been a, a, a big uh, uh, benefit for us to be able to roll things out and roll things back as well when something doesn't work. Let's see. Did I, oh, okay. Instrument the little things. So at scale, uh, five milliseconds, two milliseconds may not seem like a big deal, uh, but it, you do want to go and see Okay, where am I spending the most amount of time? One of the things we tracked down was, okay, it's, it's taking, it's hard to see in this chart, but it's taking two milliseconds to, uh, to process the move to XML. So we were still using the default to XML from Active Record instead of generating the XML programmatically for us. Um, and in the user, the user was, cut, was taking about five milliseconds. Uh, so again, we look at it and we say, well, what's the, what problem should I attack? Should I attack? the user because it's taking five milliseconds or should I attack the, the move generation because it's taking two milliseconds. But when you look at the volume, I'm doing a lot more moves. So it probably makes more sense for me to attack that and try and improve that. Also come back and, uh, and fix the move. But, but being able to do things, New Relic made it very easy to add traces uh, to see how, things were, how long things were taking. We would build custom charts to go and watch those. Again, as we rolled out features, we would go and watch those charts to see that Okay, at, we rolled out this feature, we're ramping it up, what, are, what sort of improvements? So we're constantly moder monitoring uh, the improvement of the service as we go along. Deploying with confidence. Uh, early on, it was, it, we were just a bunch of guys in a room. We're like, hey, we'll, just, we'll, do, we'll push things out. Uh, we didn't have any tests. So Rails generate scaffold does generate tests for you. Uh, it turns out it doesn't actually tell you anything. So we had tests, but they weren't, uh, they weren't doing anything for us. So pushing things out, deploying with no test, gave us no confidence. Uh, we eventually started adding tests. We didn't go and rewrite tests or write tests for the entire application. We just, as we, added new, uh, as we added new code or we refactored code, we made sure that it had uh, tests to go with it. We used a combination of RSpec. We used Cucumber to do some uh, actual in 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 integration testing, and now, uh, mo any code that gets pushed when it, we get a pull request, if that pull request does not have the associated tests uh, with it, it does not get merged in. It, if the test suite does not, the entire test suite doesn't pass, it doesn't get pushed out to production. So we have a lot more confidence that we can push things out and not break it. That being said, it doesn't mean it, everything gets caught in the test. Uh, there are still instances where, uh, obviously, supporting six different game types, uh, we do run into those scenarios where uh, something may slip through, but we, we can catch those early, write the test for those scenarios, and be confident that the next time we deploy, we haven't broken uh, the existing games or any of the other games as well. 
failing early. Uh, we were very good at this. Uh, this one right here, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, this chart was, um, we, did, we would do things like caching off uh, the number of games that you had, uh, uh, that you had played, based on, we would cache off, I think, in a, in a list of all your game IDs based on your ID. Uh, that was a fun one. Uh, for those, of, anybody pay, play plas, pass and play? in their games where you just play the game, you hand it over to a friend, they play, there's a few of you. That pass and play user actually exists on the database, it's ID number four, okay? Anybody see where this is going? <laughs> pass and play was a fairly popular thing that people would do. I always thought you'd play with people on the internet, but a lot of people start pass and play games and they'd hand it over and so we have a lot of pass and play games on the internet and when you start uh, when you start trying to cache things like, give me all the, uh, the game IDs for the pass and play user, you can take down your databases. Uh, so there were little things like that where you're like, oh, be sure to, in your test to exclude the, ta the pass and play user when you want to cache something, uh, little things like that. Also, uh, a little note of trivia, pass and play user is number four, Facebook user number four, anybody know who Facebook ID number four is? It is Mark Zuckerberg. So you have to be careful that you, he what? He is the pass and play user. So yeah, it was another thing when we added Facebook integration, you had to make sure that you knew where that ID was coming from because you didn't want to all of a sudden let people know that they were starting a game with Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, this was a big one that we got right early on was trying not to deploy before you wanted to go home. Um, <laughs> yes, if you want to get any, if you want to get sleep, um, you don't deploy before you go home. We have now uh, even backed that up even more. We don't deploy on Fridays, uh, not without special permission. So now we don't deploy and leave for the weekend when everything can go wrong. Uh, and typically what I found is that's when the users want everything to go wrong, is when you're not there, either on the weekend or in the evenings. Uh, and again, they'll let you know. They're very adamant about it. Uh, other things we've done, uh, when things do fail, and did I have a few extra minutes? Is that Okay, uh, I've just got a few more. Uh, when things do fail, being able to solve them on the server uh, has been a big, uh, big advantage for us. It's also kind of funny. Uh, the client rollout cycle, obviously, if, for those of you who know iOS, it's you've got about a two-week cycle if, to get the app submitted and then get it reviewed and get it pushed out and then hopefully people start updating. Uh, so you have to be able to react fairly quickly uh, on, the, uh, on the server side. One of the things that we found, uh, this was, uh, a little bit before I got there, but still exist in the code today, um, was there was a, a, a problem with one of the chess clients that went out that the data coming back uh, was wrong or they couldn't handle the data that they were getting. And so what they did was they said, okay, let's fix the data on the server side, but we need to keep track of which users have already had their data fixed so that we can go forward. So they said, well, let's just add a timestamp in the database, add a new column with a timestamp that says this user was fixed at this time and we know that we don't have to fix them. Uh, being the uh, developers that they were, uh, the, the column name is unfucked at. Um, <laughs> yes. Which in 2XML comes down. So in the client code you do get that. Um, and it's still out there today. Uh, <laughs> keeping track of everybody who has been fixed. Um, monitoring, we do an ex a whole lot of monitoring. Early on we were doing things with New Relic, uh, we were doing things with Scout. We've since moved over, uh, we had some friends build instrumentalapp.com, I can't say enough about those guys. Uh, they have really slick charts, very easy to track, not only Rails uh, stuff but also your custom metrics. So being able to say, hey I want to track how many users are signing up or how many uh, the, uh, different business metrics as well, so they can do that. Uh, you get these nice charts. We've actually built a custom HUD using all of their graphs coming off of their service uh, so that we can get this, but they have a really nice uh, user interface as well. So we're tracking a lot of this. If anything goes wrong, we get alerts. We're using Splunk as well for monitoring. Uh, we've got, I think, Nagios. We've got all the traditional uh, monitoring services. But for the day-to-day -day operations, this is what the server guys are looking at. Um, we are hiring. Uh, we have a stu couple studios here in Dallas. Uh, the Zynga Dallas and the Zynga with Friends studio where I'm at. Uh, we are hiring, uh, most, uh, a lot of the, uh, the server work is now out of San Francisco. 
so if you're looking to move to San Francisco, I can hook you up with that, and you can do some really fun large-scale rails work out there. Uh, but we do do some uh, Ruby stuff here in town as well. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be right of me to actually leave you without giving you some words with friends tips. Um, so this, I believe, is a fairly extensive list of the two, three, uh, two and three letter words, a lot of X words, a lot of Q words. Uh, so if you want to jot those down real quick before I go to the next slide. And good, okay. So that's all I've got. Uh, again, I'm Jeff, uh, and you can find me. I'm G. Dagley uh, in most places, and G. Dagley at Zynga if you want to get in touch with me. So thank you very much.